this upcoming discussion builds nicely on Steve and George's, George's conversation in that we're going to start talking about personalization, which of course has been the holy grail of marketing tech stacks for well over a decade now. But as many of you also probably know, there's often still a gap between the reality and the vision. But recent advancements in data science, machine learning, and audience segmentation are starting to change this. And our speakers today um, will talk about new possibilities for personalization, give you a framework for discerning the reality from the hype, uh, talk about questions like, is there such a thing as too much personalization, for example? Uh, and also, you'll hear about some real life experiences of what it takes for technology leaders uh, to implement a personalized data stack in a traditional enterprise. Uh, our speakers include uh, Amy Chang, who is CEO of a company and was recently appointed to the board at Cisco, Gail Shepard, who's a general manager at Intel, uh, and Paul Willows, who is uh, the head of global IT strategy at Walgreens. And of course, uh, our moderator uh, and my Sapphire Ventures colleague, Doug Higgins, is a managing director here with us. Uh, Doug has led our investments in companies such as LinkedIn, uh, Return Path, and Localytics, and he really is uh, passionate about the potential of marketing technologies. Doug, with that, yes. pass it over to you. And you're welcome to sit on your good side, whatever that is. Thank you, Shruti. This is great colleague. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it in the interest of time. I'm very fortunate to have three very esteemed uh, panelists, except Paul. Um, is that how it's going to be? That's how it's going to be, though. I wish you guys Flips could join us for the, the, the pre-panel discussions. but. I think what we're going to do is touch on some of the topics um, that have already been discussed, but in a slightly different way. And then given that we have you know, uh, executives representing big companies and small companies, I want to speak to kind of the audience in terms of customers of technology and sellers. Not that anybody wants to sell to anybody in the room today, right? This is all about, OK. Guys, come on. I thought, I, thought going, I thought going before the cocktail reception was going to be tough. Apparently, it's after going after Steve and George is the tough, the tough slot. So Amy, why don't you kick things off for us? Thanks. So my name is Amy Chang. I'm CEO and founder of a company, because we accompany you everywhere. I spent um, the formative years of my career at Google. Uh, for eight years, I ran Google Analytics, where we took it from less than 1% market share to about 70% of the entire web, um, which was a very fun ride. And I serve on the boards of Splunk and Cisco. Hi, I'm Gail Shepard. I am a general manager with uh, Intel Corporation. Actually, um, I just celebrated one year anniversary of acquisition. I was the CEO of a company called Saffron Technology. Uh, I was an investor in, Sa in Saffron uh, since 2004. And Saffron is really uh, a, a self-learning, one-shot learning, uh, memory-based uh, uh, artificial intelligence or cognitive system. So we'll talk a little bit about why that matters to Intel. But uh, I have to report in that I'm delighted to be part of Intel. It's always kind of scary, as some of you know, to you know, leave a startup. You worked on it for 11, 15 years. And you move into a very, very large corporation. But I have at, at my access this amazing laboratory from drones to connected watches to um, uh, a variety of, of cloud to edge uh, capabilities that we now have the opportunity to really integrate into. So it's been an exciting thing and look forward to uh, talking more about that. So uh, good afternoon, my name's Paul Willows. I'm the uh, Vice President for Global IT Strategy for Walgreens Boots Alliance. Um, I'll maybe talk a little bit about WBA, Walgreens Boots Alliance, because I'm not sure it'll be intimately familiar with all of you, apart from Walgreens, of course, which is a brand that needs no introduction. Um, but the company was formed in January 2014, and it brought together Walgreens from the USA and Alliance Boots uh, from Europe. Uh, Alliance Boots is made up in itself of boots, which is the kind of the UK equivalent for Walgreens, for those of you who don't know it, and then a pharmaceutical uh, wholesaling operation of 25 countries around Europe. Uh, we also, as well as those markets, we operate a retail presence in uh, Mexico, Chile, Thailand, Norway, and we have our own manufacturing facilities as well for beauty product. So we're a bit of a conglomerate almost. Uh, and, uh, it's, a, it's a large, complicated organization. Um, I operate transversely across that. Uh, so in my role, I get to go everywhere and do everything, though you may guess from my accent that I'm uh, from the Boots organization originally. Um, my role is very broad, uh, but it's also very shallow, uh, which is a fact that I feel will come readily apparent, sadly, as this panel unfolds, but anyway. 
<laughs> so, Paul, <laughs> I'm actually going to um, start with um, you. Punishment begins. Punishment <laughs> begins. Um, you have lots of different ways, uh, technologies you can implement to focus on personalizing the consumer experience. How do you prioritize what's going to be the most impactful? I mean, I think here in the Valley, there's a lot of you know, thirst for the next big thing and the technology innovation. But as a customer, you're always getting pitched. You're always having priorities internally and externally. How do you really know what's going to be the most impactful? And in any given day, what do, what do you focus? What really gets your attention? Well, I mean, maybe the best way into this is to, um, you know, first of all, to say that customer intimacy is obviously a, a major a strategic pillar for the organization um, because through the customer in intimacy, we can build better band brand engagement. And a lot of the success, certainly from the boot side of the business, historically has been built on our ability to differentiate through uh, the use of our data and personalization. And of course, we are very fortunate in that regard. Um, from a data perspective, it's a target-rich environment. We have tens of millions of transactions every day. Um, so we've got a large data set from which to select. Now, what our primary uh, mechanism as things stand today is the loyalty programs that we run both in Walgreens with a balanced reward program, 85, 87 million or so active members in the US, and uh, the Advantage card scheme that we run in the UK, uh, which has got 80 million active members, which is about the third of the UK population. So. Uh, very effective penetration. And a lot of the, uh, the way that Boots was able to succeed and differentiate itself over the last 15 years has been really to get into the data that exists in that loyalty program. Um, we were, Boots was successfully able to fend off the threat uh, that the, the grocers posed in the UK market who were taking chunks of market share all over the place and really being able to drive down and understand customers' hopes, wants, needs, and desires, uh, and offer and target appropriately is what drove a lot of the success of the organization. And we are continuing on that journey today, both in the US and other markets. So we're exporting those capabilities um, out to Thailand, into Mexico, and into Chile. And you know that stack contains all the technologies that you would expect it to. I'm, I, this is a very well-versed and knowledgeable audience, so I don't think we need to go through that. But to try and answer your question on how we prioritize it, um, well, I think we, we, we prioritize it in the same way that we prioritize anything else we do in the organization. We are, I know it's a cliche, uh, but we are customer-led, and what we do is led by customer insight. Um, and we are always looking for the next piece of customer insight that's actionable to us. And that isn't just about necessarily um, targeting an offer to you for a new beauty product. It also plays into things like new product development, where we're looking for uh, customers, women in particular, unmet needs, where we can develop new products uh, and deliver solutions that you know, were previously unknown in the marketplace. So prime example, I know I'm not supposed to pitch, but there's a service in the UK called Matchmade because uh, apparently, I, I, I'm not a user myself, most women use the wrong shade of foundation. Now, we were able to understand that through research and insight and develop a whole range of new beauty products and some analytical capability that was deployed in store that would analyze your skin uh, and then be able to select for you the perfect fit. So that's just one example of where Insight is driving product development and how we would prioritize. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so Amy and then and then Gail, yes. I think both of you um, represent a very interesting mix because you're currently CEO of a startup on the board of Cisco. Some of us have heard of that company, <laughs> as well as Splunk. Um, so you've just heard from a from a potential customer. How do you pitch the unique personalization that you can give to your clients and rise above the noise and really make this kind of a game-changing solution, given everything that's out there? So I, I doubt people in the audience know yet what we do. We're a virtual chief of staff. So the guy standing next to the president whispering in his ear, oh, you met him two weeks ago, and that's his wife, and her name is Sharice, et cetera, et cetera. That's us for you. So basically, by virtue of being your chief of staff, we have to be radically personalized. We have to make it very much crafted around 
your interaction patterns, your communication patterns. So the things we fundamentally need to understand are, what's the entirety of your network? What does that look like for you? How important is every single one of those people to you? Who are they to you? And who are they in the wider world? So that we can identify opportunity for you and we can help you figure out, OK, well, you know, this incoming email is, is from this person. Should I answer it? Should I bother taking the time? Should I actually say yes to the activity that they're asking me to speak at something or to go to something? And so we have to take those interaction communication patterns and take them in the context of you and your schedule and your patterning. That's our entire business. So if we're unable to take that data and bring it in and mesh it in a way that is extremely contextualized to you, then we failed. So the entire thing is radical personalization. By definition. Yes, by definition. Gail, you you talked about being part of Intel, but talk about Saffron for those of the, in the audience. What what is Saffron, and what, why is that? Why are you on this panel? Why is it relevant? Why am I here? <laughs> why am I here? <laughs> so Saffron Saffron uh, has created a platform. It is a from data ingestion, NLP, uh, all the way up to um, expression of of outcomes and results to an uh, to an end user. Um, it, it really um, started many years ago, uh, in 1999, actually, the original co-founders are very much with me today, and, and we are now uh, 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 partners and have been for a long time, um, uh, thought that uh, rich personalization, individualization is really what was going to matter in the future. And they were ex-IBMers. One was the chief scientist for the IBM uh, Intelligent Agent Lab, and the other one was a senior engineer there when they left to form Saffron. So uh, the journey would go like this. They thought they would specialize in medicine to begin with. 9-11 would happen shortly after that. They would be uh, recruited to help uh, in national security and intelligence, intelligence analysis. And so uh, when I met them, that's what they were doing. And we would, and we, and we, we did some very, very special things in that, in that journey around, and that would be in the 2004 to 2006 time frame, really trying to identify bad guys and understand their behaviors, their patterns, right? And people who were trying to be someone else and didn't want you to know that they were really, you know, Joe Smith and they were pretending to be, you know, Bob Jones. And so, uh, so our, 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 uh, our technology was able to identify very granular similarities between people. So regardless of how they tried to change their patterns, we could find those patterns that could not be changed. We just have some habits that we're just going to express those patterns over and over again, even when we're trying to be someone else. So that individualization uh, we've applied now to personalization. And one of our customers I can talk about publicly in this way would be USAA, who many of you will know, is a financial services company uh, uh, serving our, our, um, our armed forces and their families. And so their goal, they win customer support awards year after year, and their goal is to take care of their members, not to, not to sell them stuff, although that's important, they make money, but to, to take care of them as events in their life change. Uh, as they as they get married, have a baby, leave the armed forces, uh, retire, et cetera. And so uh, they're trying to predict that very next service that the individual needs. And so we were able, so what we did is we were able to uh, help them move uh, from a 35% accuracy to a very high level to a 92% accuracy in predicting what service or product a customer would need next in order to handle the event that's occurring in their life. And that has some great outcomes, right? Because we're understanding the individual at such a granular level, and it's event-oriented, it's time-based, temporal similarity, that our predictive accuracy, accuracy is very high. And that works for some use cases, not for all, in terms of personalization. Um, so, so we specialize in, in when the granularity and the, the a segment of one is clearly needed. And I love the, I love the chief of staff uh, idea over here, and we absolutely need that. So we'll talk later. <laughs> that's great. But that's a great example of a, a great use case. Great. Thanks, Gail. So you know, I just want to bring in uh, some of the words that we've used through the previous panels, because it applies to radical personalization. And we talked it about this morning about the connected customer, having a 360-degree view, ubiquity, um, cohesive experiences. How can we create seamless connectivity with the customer so that we are so personalized, we know exactly when they want it, who they want it. Is there a downside to this, Paul? Where do, we, where do we draw the line when we say personalization? Sure. And, and it's particularly, I think, interesting for the 
audience, given what Walgreens knows about you um, as a consumer? Yeah, I mean, we, there's a sort of principle that we tr try to work to, which is show me you know me, um, but as appropriate, and then kind of open brackets legal as well. So, and, and it's, it's a very pertinent, but it's also quite a difficult question. I mean, the, the legal side at least is clear, although the plethora of different privacy laws that take place across Europe make it quite a complicated environment, but at least you know where the line is and you need to stay on the right side of it. Appropriate is where it becomes harder to judge because there's all sorts of factors that play into that. Age, demographic, location, um, and at the moment, I guess, we are operating on a common sense basis. So I think, for instance, you know, we offer erectile dysfunction services being straightforward, like the last speaker. We do not uh, send people personalised reminders to say, hey, it's time for you to come in for your <laughs> next test, because some people may find that somewhat uh, creepy. Yeah. Um, you know, research, a speaker earlier today was talking about uh, visual recognition and, you know, you walk into a store, associates immediately recognise you and come and serve you. Customer research would show that people definitely find that creepy now, today. Whether they'll find that creepy five or ten years from now, I don't know. So I, I, I think it's a, a subjective landscape and a shifting one as well. And I don't have the complete answer, yeah. but common sense generally is a good rule of thumb. Amy, where do you draw the line on creepy? Well, I have to say creepiness is a little bit like pornography, right? When you see it, you just know it. Um, and we, you were asking me earlier about the Target example where... Um, and do you mind if I, if I give the please background? Please, so, give it. Um, I think this is an important topic for all of us to kind of grok because it's not just the legal ramifications, it's the ethical. And where do we draw the boundaries. And just for those of you that don't know the example, um, in, it was a 2012 New York Times article about a father of a teenage daughter who received in the mail um, a coupon for diapers. And the data scientists at Target were so excited because they had figured out that if you had bought certain kinds of lotion, your, pretens your propensity to be pregnant was very high to such a high level that they were excited to, to upsell you the diapers that you will eventually know. And Amy, you were not, um, you, you know, with all your accomplishments, you, you've been on, you know, you're currently on the Cisco board, Splunk board, you're CEO of the company. You weren't on the Target Advisory Board at the time, but you were after. Yeah. Tell so us about that. I was at Google um, on the ads exec team then, and I remember that morning that news came out, and we all cringed. We all kind of went, oh. Because you could easily see how that would happen, right? You're doing this predictive targeting. You have all of these predictive models around baskets and what exactly people will buy in conjunction with other products. I mean, we see that every day on Amazon. Other customers bought this, recommended for you, right? And it's just another product, except it wasn't in this case. And so it really it created a dialogue. And we started talking a lot more about well, the products themselves and you know the ads themselves, we have to think about the content of those in and of themselves. We can't just treat everything the same. And it actually led to some classifications of things. And I also think there's a principle developed of, you know, if this is the line, let's be one standard deviation behind the line, because we have a massive brand to protect. And as a startup, we're towing the line. We're right up to the line more, because we have to be, right? We're we're still establishing a brand, but we can't go. We can't cross over it either, because then we're dead. And so this is one of those those things that um, we're just always watching out for the mistakes other people make and iteratively addressing it, you know, in our business. But it is a really, really tough one. Yeah, but I, I think that's kind of the point. I mean, you don't know it's a mistake until it's until made. it's a mistake. Yeah. And as technologists, everybody in this room, we're always focused on pushing the envelope to have whether it's AI or the best algorithm to predict everything. Gail, how do, help us in this, in this brave new world we're going down. How do we um, have the moral compass? And do, is that our job? Do we care in terms of the technology experience? How do you, how do you balance both? <clears throat> well, I absolutely think it's our job. I think, uh, and, and Intel, um, we're, we're extraordinarily thoughtful about this process because we're developing systems now, right? Self-learning systems, connected systems, everything's smart. 
Um, and so as we think about what we're developing, we have to go through the analysis of what are the potential outcomes, right? We're not gonna know, we're not gonna get it all, clearly. But self-learning systems, um, you know, they, we did a, you know, a lot of discussion in the marketplace about the self-driving car, right? And, and the judgment required in order to determine what do I do in the event some, this, this thing happens. Is that a ball rolling in front of me, a child running in front of me, et cetera? And based on the decision I make, what are the outcomes, right? Uh, do I die? Does someone else die? Does someone else get injured, et cetera, et cetera, right? Big, big decisions. And so that kind of thinking has to go into our application development and our systematic thinking about the future with AI. And I think it's, and we don't know what we don't know, right? Because yeah. we haven't been there before. Can I make Please. a suggestion yeah. for Please. the other yeah. entrepreneurs in the audience? So one of the things we have found immensely helpful for our own testing is to have an alpha group of testers who are very high tolerance in terms of that, that line, right? And who are vocal and will basically kick us in the ass if we even start to step over that line. And because they're, they're so vocal, they stop us from making larger mistakes with you know, our larger user base. But I think that is one of the best early warning indicators for you've just, you've, you've crossed over. I agree, that's a good place to, to, to go. I also think though it has to come before in the design process. You have to bring it into the, the, the same kind of thinking into the design process. Yeah. Great, well now that we've armed everybody with a moral compass, now let's, let's get back to <laughs> you know, more the more exciting kind of, what are your predictions of, if we're in five years from now, we're talking about radical personalization. We've, we've, we always, there's always this battle between what's, you know, whether it's neural networks or AI, like what's the timing of everything? Five years from now, the panelists of radical personalization will be talking about what? I, I think, you know, mixed reality and augmented reality, it's less than five years from now, right? So that minority report scenario, sure. I wonder when customer tolerance will flip. Exactly. To say, I actually want the services you're going to provide me because they're so personalized that when I walk into the store, you've already gotten the basket ready for me that you know I likely want. Or the recommendations are just so damn good that I don't mind that it's slightly creepy. Right. So Agreed. I think that's coming. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree. I think directionally the, 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 it's clear where we're heading. It's only going to move faster and get more precise. So, you know, the segmentation that, you know, we were running 15 years ago was very broad, but effective. It's slowly, slowly creeping down. We're not at one yet. We'll soon get to one. Uh, you know, the, our ability to target you in real time, in the store, at whatever location, ubiquitously across all channels, is increasing. Um, that's the story we're going to be looking at in five years from now. And then what, where do we go from there? Yeah. I'm hoping that, yeah. that we are in control of more of that in five years than we are today, and that it is a more holistic lifestyle look at personalization so that it's not just a single vendor or individual uh, organization talking to us, but we are actually looking at across those opportunities that are, that are coming into us to organize them in such a way that we can, we can optimize ourselves as to where we go, what we buy, who we buy it from, and when we buy it. That's what I would hope for all of us as a po and I'm sorry for everyone in there, I'm sorry, but you understand what I mean? I think I that's, that's yeah. ultimately no, no, where we And, and I think yeah. partnership is very important yeah. and we yeah. should be open to that, yeah, I, exactly. I, I agree. Yeah. So I'm gonna get us back on how much time, I know that we, there's a time up here and then there's the real time. So <laughs> I, want, I want to give uh, the opportunity to the audience for questions because I, I think with our, our panelists there's such a spectrum of things that we could continue to talk about. Um, any questions for Amy? Oh, right over here, please. Uh, I'm going to throw it at Paul. Paul, you have two different customer databases. You've got the unregulated retail side, sure. and you've got the regulated pharmacy side. And could you just share a little bit about how all of what you're talking about applies in the regulated side versus the unregulated side as to what you do and how, how the customer experience operates? So the, the regulated side is obviously under much more discipline and control than, than the retail side. And actually, our, uh, not necessarily our desire, but our moves in that space up until now have been quite uh, modest. modest, I think it's fair to say. So uh, w without kind of giving too much away right now, um, we would like to do more, but we need to do it in an ethical, a legal, and appropriate fashion. Um, and I think I'll just probably leave it at that if that's short but sweet. Paul, I mean, related to that, Paul, the, um, 
Paul Chapman from Box was saying, um, or on an earlier uh, panel, that a lot of the times it's not having the technology to personalize experience, it's culture, it's inertia. Walgreens is going through a small transaction, purchasing Rite Aid. Sure. How do you, how do you balance this, whether it's legal, ethical, the regulatory business, these big corporate organizations, how, how do you make sure that you're, you said your guarding principles was always what's best from the customer, customer led? I you have all agree. these other things that you're balancing. How do well, you it's just all willing, isn't it? You have to keep uh, you know, mutually incompatible concepts simultaneously held and executed. So there is no magic bullet to this. I mean, it's a balancing act. We have got you know, commercial imperatives. We've got big transactions that we need to get away, but we also need to do the right things for our customers and our patients everywhere and every day. And that isn't easy. And sometimes the two are potentially in conflict. And if they are, then we are customer-led. Mm -hmm. So again, there's no, there's no one straight answer to that. It's very situational. Great. I thought there was another question over here. Right here. about personalization, um, it seems that there's going to be, and we spoke about the different types of people, and it seems that who's your first target audience? Who do you think is going to adopt that kind of, to some of us, intrusive service that we would expect from a human, a confidant? Who's that? What, did you model a specific type of person, an industry, an age group, a demographic? So a persona, perhaps. Yeah. I think there's a, a psychographic persona, which is someone who doesn't have enough time, right? So if you have five or more external meetings per week and you're someone who enjoys feeling prepared for those meetings and you want the anxiety of having to do that preparation removed and you just want that time back, then you are very much in our target audience. So anyone from a Beth Comstock, right, who uses it every morning when she wakes up first thing because she wants to know what is going on with my entire network? What is all the company news and what is all the people news for everyone who's important to me? Because we've seen, oh, she's gonna be meeting with this person in two weeks or she's meeting with this person today. What does she need to know now when she first wakes up? And I think that, that promise that we make to you then is we must keep your data private, right? Your data is private to you and we are your chief of staff. So you are basically the center of our being, right? Our nucleus is you. And so that promise has to stay true. Thanks. Can, can I just add a question there? Sure. Don't you come sometimes in a conflict when you have two customers that actually should know about each other? Then what, what do you do in these cases? You don't use the information you have from one and forward no. it to the other one? We don't cross populate. We can't, right? Because we're not in a position to draw that line and make that judgment call for you. That's a judgment call you should get to make for you. So we could surface it and say, would you like to meet Mike? We think Mike might be interesting to you. But what we can't do is tell you anything about why Mike would be interesting to you beyond what's public. Right. Great. Well, I think I'm going to wrap up now so that we can uh, stay on time. I'm, hopefully, you guys are all going to be here for a, a little bit of time after for breakout sessions. And uh, I encourage you guys to. Um, continue the dialogue in the breakout. So thank you, everybody. And thank you very much, Dr. Yeah.